You're listening to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro, the place to learn about new technology and technological advances before they become mainstream. This podcast is sponsored by D-Link Technology. Make your home smarter, safer, and truly seamless. Let's get into it. Welcome to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro. I'm your host, Carrie Roberts, and we are welcoming back our guest today, Matt Valancourt, the Senior Director of Business Sales at D-Link. Welcome back, Matt. Thanks so much for being here again. Hey, thanks for having me again, Carrie. Uh, Definitely appreciate it. So in this episode, we are talking about refreshing your network for 2020. Matt, how often should you refresh and how many times should you actually consider refreshing your network? Yeah, you know, I think I think um, you know that's going to vary depending on the type of industry that that you or or your your end customer is in. But I think on average, it's typically about every three to five years is where most people typically consider going through some form of a network refresh. But you really should consider refreshing when you have a significant need or business value or security value to do so. Waiting based on a calendar to do something um, when there might be a significant value to doing it sooner, you know, is, is definitely more of the court that I sit in. And I think a lot of the customers out there today do as well. But, you know, due to yearly budgets for some customers like K through 12 schools, they're refreshing different aspects of their network each year. You know, so they might refresh the core one year and refresh the Wi-Fi another year and refresh the AV equipment another year, right? Because it's it's very dependent on that. So one of the, I guess, biggest key things I'll say to that is you just want to try to avoid proprietary networking or proprietary products or situation as much as you can because uh, sometimes what Zoltar sees in his crystal ball for your organization isn't always what comes to pass. So uh, try not to pigeonhole yourself. And one of the concerns people have every year is about whether or not they should switch technologies with so many new things coming about. And you suggest a switch is not just a switch. It's about what's coming in the future and understanding why you should consider investing now versus down the road. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. And I, I think I'll, I'm probably going to use more of an analogy for this that I think a lot of people can um, can probably relate to a little bit more. Because I understand a lot of this has to do with budget, but it also, I think, has a lot to do with value for the budget. So, you know, at, at first, when the first iPhone came out, you know, it was, it was a game changer, right? Touch screens and, and apps and all this other fun stuff when we all got off of our old school clamshell StarTac phones and stuff like that and, and came into the future, if you will. Um, when that happened, I think a lot of people every single year that a new iPhone came out or, or, you know, substitute, you know, when Samsung came out, started coming out with theirs, every year, everyone was on board with buying a new phone, waiting in line, upgrading every 12 months, paying the, 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 the fees to upgrade early because they saw a, a noticeable value in doing the upgrade. There were definitive things that were just like, oh my God, that's a game changer again. I need that new thing. But nowadays, I think the upgrades are less noticeable. You know, phones are a little bit faster, but will you as the everyday consumer notice that it's faster? Eh, maybe, maybe not. It's got a better camera for people who like to take specific types of photos. So, you know, again, less and less of the population are upgrading their phones every single year when a new version comes out, partly because of the cost versus the perceived value that they're getting out of it, which is not as compelling as it was, say, five years ago. Now, switches, I will say, right now are on the opposite side of that trend, right? Uh, You know, I I understand a network is nowhere near as interesting as a new phone, (laughs) but the phones are going to be a big driver in the need to upgrade your network as more people connect and video conference and bring their smart devices onto your network. The demand on the network is going to be greater and greater and greater. And going from a one megapixel camera to a 10 megapixel camera with multiple lenses, and all kinds of other crazy stuff on your iPhone. Huge difference. Everyone's like, yep, no brainer. I'm totally going to do that. Well, going from a one gig network to a 10 gig network is very much the same noticeable difference 
as far as the upgrade to service and the throughput of the devices that are on your network. So I guess I'll leave it at this. Um, there's a lot of race cars on your network today. A lot, of, a lot of hyped up awesome phones and stuff like that on your network today. But your networks are laden with potholes and they slow down the cars and in some cases can damage the cars. So we've been on one gig networks for over 20 years now. In terms of infrastructure, we should be planning and implementing roads that are capable of supporting self-driving cars and that are prepared to handle flying cars, right? So, so that's the road is your network. And, and that's the type of networks that we should be focusing on and developing now to prepare for these next leaps in technology that are coming what seems monthly now. So it's the equivalent of getting up to 10 gig or or even 40 gig networks. And we should be looking at getting those started today. And another thing to be thinking about when refreshing for 2020 is about POE or power over ethernet. And more and more devices are going POE. What does that mean? And what is the future of it? Yeah, you know, POE, POE has been around for a while, but it's kind of had its niche areas, I think, that, that people were using it in. Um, um, you know, typically, I think the most common things that people know it's used for today is access points, wireless access points, and, and IP cameras. But that's rapidly evolving and rapidly changing. And, you know, running 110 lines all over a new build or having to retrofit an existing building to have traditional power really is costly and and it limits the adaptability, right? If you want to move something from one point of a room to another point of a room and you have to call up an electrician and have them come in and, and, you know, shut down power and do this and do that in order to move it. And it's, it's costly. Whereas with POE, you're taking a low voltage cat five E or cat six cable and just moving its endpoint of where it's coming out. Right. And in some States, you don't even need an electrician to do that. You just have to have a low voltage expert, which most integrators nowadays carry on staff to be able to do that. And I think too, with PoE, it's, it's growing to the point where five years ago, maximum was typically around 15 watts. And that was the best you could expect to get from PoE. Now you can get up to 90 watts of power on, on one port. And that's a certified standard that's out there today. And some go beyond that. So what are we going to see with this? Uh, POE lighting, I think, is one of the biggest things. And access control, smart buildings. These devices are predicted to grow exponentially in the next five years. The POE provides a cost savings on, on energy usage, but also a cost savings on managing the attached equipment. Let's say uh, a customer calls you saying a camera's not working or Wi-Fi coverage has gone down in an area, uh, or maybe a lighting system isn't responding and turning on when someone walks into the room. Five years ago, you, you would send a physically ask one of your technicians to get in a truck, drive over to the site, assess what was wrong, spend hours and possible multiple trips, not to mention the downtime for the customer to, to fix the issue. And nowadays, you can just remotely log in, troubleshoot the connection. You could even do uh, what I deem the most popular tech support response there is. Carrie, I don't, I don't know how often uh, you, you've experienced having to call in to support, but the first thing they ask you to do is what? Turn it off? And turn it back on, right? Yes. Yes. (laughs) So with with most POE switches and systems nowadays, you can remotely do that, right? So when your customer calls you up and says, hey, I have blah, blah, blah issue, camera one is showing no picture, you can immediately log in, power off that port and power it back on, effectively turning the camera off and turning it back on again and see if that resolves your issue, at least immediately resolves your issue. So you don't have to do an emergency truck roll, right? You get the camera back up and running, and there's there's many other features that you can test nowadays um, with these these smart POE switching devices. You know, you can test the uh, the integrity of the cable. You know, maybe maybe the cable was cut or has some other kind of issue. You can test those on the switches nowadays too, amongst many other things. So, not only is this a, a energy savings, but it's a genuine cost savings for people who are managing buildings, managing equipment. And Matt, I mean, people can tell by listening, you really are so passionate and knowledgeable about security. And in the first episode of this show, which if you're listening and you haven't heard that episode yet, definitely check it out. The link will be in the show notes. 
Matt, you talked about securing your network from outside attacks and hacking is increasing every year. And so it's important to understand network hardening features. Can you tell us what those are and what's important for 2020? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, as we talked on that episode, there's obviously every year we, we hear and see increasing number of attacks, uh, increasing number of breaches and the costs and everything else. And as we talked on, on that episode, you know, we talked about protecting yourselves from outside attacks, but increasingly, and as the, uh, the 90s horror movie trope goes, um, that phone call is coming from inside the house. So now and now more and more networks are being attacked from inside the network. So these attackers are figuring out ways, typically through phishing and some other techniques, to actually get inside the network. So having a firewall or endpoint detection response software, de- essential. And no way am I saying to not have those things. Definitely have those things, right? But let's just not solely rely on them to be our end-all, be-all security for our networks. So you know, being able to see and control network access is one of the best ways to prevent someone who clicked on the thing in the email from allowing them to compromise your system and, and, and let a compromised machine loose on your network. So some very basic things, and I, I, I'll try to simplify uh, the tech talk as best I can, that switches, especially layer two and layer three switches, will allow you to do so you can leverage VLANs, which are are, are virtual networks. So you can virtually segregate networks from each other. So you don't want your POS system and your camera system to be on the same network. But rather than setting up different networks and getting different switches and all that other fun stuff, you can do it virtually within the switch itself. I think a lot of people know about that one. Pretty, Pretty common type of practice nowadays You can also use uh, network access control, more commonly known as 802.1x, or people who use uh, what's called a radius server. Basically, it's a way to verify that the person trying to access the network is truly the person, or, or at the very least, the trusted machine that has been certified to access the network. So it helps prevent people from from hijacking or spoofing, pretending to be you, right? A couple others, uh, BPDU, or, or more commonly known as Root Guard, basically turning this feature on, and a lot of switches have this, basically prevents a switch from being hijacked and tricked into thinking it is the root switch or the main switch that's running your network topology. So if someone can gain access to a lower level switch in the network, and trick it into thinking it's the highest level switch, people can then, you know, attackers can then carry out and and gain a lot more access to your network if they can do that. So it's a very simple feature that you can just turn on and and, and actively monitor and manage. And, you know, I have two others for you. And I I did mention these on on our call uh, uh, at the beginning here. And that is uh, access control, uh, MAC and WAC control, whitelists and blacklists. So, Tell your system who's allowed to be on your network, but don't stop there. Make a blacklist, too, of people who aren't allowed on your network. And then I think most important and near and dear to my heart is disabling admin login. And what I mean by that is a lot of network equipment today, when you first get it and you first turn it on, you log into the product by typing admin as the username, and then some random password they gave you, hopefully a unique random password that they gave you. But the problem with that is that everyone knows that. So I now know half of what I need to know to gain access to your system. I know that the username is admin. So disabling that admin username and assigning admin access to a proper username that has a proper and unique strong password attached to it is going to make your network uh, that much stronger to someone coming in and, and, and being able to attack it. I know some products don't allow you to actually disable the admin function or the admin account. So um, typically what I say to that is um, just create an extremely difficult password for that admin account and don't give it out to anyone. Don't, don't digitally record it somewhere and, and in some cases, that admin account isn't needed for anything once you've assigned admin access to someone else. So in theory, you could just make it the most ridiculous password ever and then forget it. 
you're never going to need it again in order to log in. I, I do get in some systems, the admin account is required to do some things, but those are typically older systems and um, maybe it's time for a network refresh, So, which is why we're talking. So uh, I, I would say those are, are some of the uh, basic but best things that you can do to protect your network just using stuff that's built into the switch. Hey everyone, we hope you're enjoying this episode of B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro. Let's pause for a moment to recognize our sponsor, D-Link Systems. Are network speeds slowing you down or security risks top of mind? Talk with D-Link Systems. Leverage award-winning products and deploy networks that are second to none with D-Link wireless, surveillance, and switching solutions. Contact Ashley Ruggiero at Ingram Micro today. That's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y dot Ruggiero, R-U-G-G-E-R-I-O at IngramMicro.com. Also, real quick before we jump straight back into the episode today, we want to tell you about Ingram Micro Financial Solutions and how you can maximize your buying power and get to yes with your customers faster. For the last nine years, Ingram Micro has been Channel Pro's reader's choice for best financing options. Put the power of our credit and leasing options to work for you. You can easily contact financial solutions at ingrammicro.com. All right, let's get back to the show. Matt, you always give a nice breakdown and analogies and everything to help everybody understand. One other thing, one of the most popular switches today, which you talked about a little bit earlier in this episode, is a one gig switch. Do you think this is enough with business trends moving to more video calls or VR platforms for their meetings? And how does edge planning fit into all of that? Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, uh, you know, in the, in, in earlier, one gig, uh, I think uh, 1998 was when the first, uh, I guess, certified standard for one gig switching came out. And, and there's been many advancements to it over the years for sure. But we've been on this platform for a really long time. And I think more and more people are pushing to 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig. And really what it comes down to is latency and throughput. How many people can be on the network doing things while still having a quality of service for everyone who's doing their things, right? So, you know, think of while you're at home on your home network and, you know, someone's trying to stream Netflix, someone's trying to play a video game, someone's watching YouTube on their iPad. You have all these people trying to do multiple intensive bandwidth things and it, everyone suffers, right? Because everyone's trying to uh, uh, bang against each other at the same time. And the reality of it is the capabilities of your network are only going to be as good as the weakest link. That's true to a point. I think for me, the most important thing you can do is move to 10 or 40 gig at the core of your network. It will give you the most bang for your buck. It'll give you the greatest setup for your future needs. So even if you still have one gig at the edge, having that bigger backbone is going to allow for lower latencies as you work to refresh endpoints and other devices on the network itself. And, and any gamers out there that are listening, I think they know what latency means, but I guess a simple example is response time matching, right? So have you ever watched the news and they're showing a live reporter who's reporting from some distant place and they're over satellite, right? And they're asked a question and they don't respond for three, four, or five seconds. So that's the latency that is happening with the network that they're using to communicate back to the, the main news office, right? So is it going to uh, necessarily have a, a terrible impact on what you're trying to do? No, it's not necessarily going to lose the message or anything like that. But it's still delivered. But as telecommunication or remote meetings and presentations start to take over for the manual, I'm going to fly my rep out to your building and we're going to have a face-to-face -face meeting, you don't want something simple like uh, bad syncing to take away from the message of your meeting. And as telecommuting and, and at-home work is becoming more and more of a thing, but it's going to be more and more important that you have a network that is capable of handling this both at home and in the office as well. And you've talked a lot about a lot of different things here today in refreshing for 2020. What kinds of products does D-Link offer that can help with a network refresh? Yeah, so, so D-Link has actually has a full 
and robust line of enterprise switching solutions. We've been doing this for over 30 years now. So from anywhere from a basic unmanaged switch to a web smart, a, a layer two, a layer three managed switch. We also have industrial switches. We have top of rack and, and bare metal switches for data center deployments. And we even have our newest release, which is uh, Nucleus Cloud Managed Switches. So all that remote stuff I was talking about earlier with being able to remotely power down and power up a port or be able to test and see if there's a bad cable on a port and things along those lines that prevent truck rolls, prevent loss of income, that's all built in on our Nucleus Cloud Managed Switches, um, which we just released uh, in November of 2019. So. Perfect. Where can people learn more about everything we talked about today or if they want to connect with you to ask any questions? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the one of the best things, we have a network refresh guide out there um, that folks can download and, and, and take a good long peruse through. And that's on our, our business blog, which is uh, businessblog.us.dlink.com. We'll have that information in the show notes as well. Or you can just go to dlink.com and click on the business tab at the top. And it'll take you right to our business enterprise page and you'll see a pop-up for the network refresh guide. It'll, it'll show up on the screen right away for you. So those are probably two of the best ways. And, and to, to get a hold of me, to, ha- to, to talk more tech, Matt Valancourt on, on LinkedIn should be, uh, should be pretty easy to find. And uh, I'm always game to have some new connections and, and uh, talk about the future. And we asked you last time when you were here, where do you see technology going in the next year? But when it comes to the network of the future, what will we be doing on the network in five years? And what does that mean for our existing infrastructure? I think um, more. (laughs) Is that an acceptable response? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, as like I mentioned before, as as telecommuting and things like that become more and more uh, prevalent in the marketplace, I think you're going to start to see virtual reality or augmented reality start to grow. Definitely a lot more video conferencing is going to be a big way for people to go out into the market and have that face-to-face conversation with their customer while saving the cost of actually putting a rep on a plane and sending them out there. And I think, you know, VR and AR kind of adds to that look and feel of really being there when you're not really there. And I know there's a lot more advances in technology coming in the pro AV space right now, which is, is only going to add more load to the network. You know, as, as pro AV moves away from traditional HDMI switching and they're moving into what's called AV over IP, it's another thing added to the network, right? It's, a, it's, it's another device or, or a lot more devices they're going to be putting increased demand on your network. So making sure you have the pipeline there now that can handle these future demands is definitely going to be critical to, to making sure that you're, you're set up and good to go for the future. Well, as always, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and passion with us today. And we look forward to, I'm sure, having you on again, Matt. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. If you like this episode or have a question, join the discussion on Twitter at Ingram Tech Soul with the hashtag B2B Tech Talk. Thank you for tuning in and subscribing to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro. You've been listening to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro, hosted by Carrie Roberts and sponsored by D-Link Technology. B2B Tech Talk is a joint production by Sweetfish Media and Ingram Micro. Ingram Micro production handled by Laura Burton and Christine Fan. To not miss an episode, subscribe today in your favorite podcast platform.